So, today we will just uh, see the details about wave loads on structures. This part of the lecture is extremely important for the design of offshore structures. The design of structures, I mean the on land structures and offshore structures differ mainly because of the action of waves on structures in offshore. You should recollect the basics of wave motion wherein we saw that the waves are unsteady motion on the particle velocities and the acceleration are very important and we looked at a theory which is called as linear Aries theory which is used to describe the particle motions as well as the dynamic pressures and all other informations what is going on below the ocean waves. Having that in mind, today we will see this topic, loads on offshore structures can broadly be classified as environmental loads and functional loads. Functional loads are more or less well understood and these kind of loads are almost similar to that what we have on on land structures. So, this can be either constant static loads or dynamic loads or varying loads due to the operation of a drilling cranes or some of the offshore platforms will have a helipad wherein the that kind of loads also have to be taken care etc. So, these are all more or less like well understood kind of loads and it is not so new for at least for the civil engineers. But what is important for us apart from the functional load for which this lecture is devoted is the prediction or the evaluation of the environmental loads. So, the environmental loads are due to wind, due to ocean waves, due to ocean currents and then finally, ice which is not directly relevant to tropical countries, but of course, in certain part of the world parts of the world you need to consider the action of ice also. However, in this lecture this part will not be considered, we will be looking at the wind wave and currents of all these environmental loads, the loads due to waves very often dominate and these loads only dictate the design of any offshore structure. So, you see that evaluation of the wave loads have to be done as close as possible to reality. The precise evaluation of the loads exerted on any structure in the offshore by ocean waves is quite complicated and that is this is because of several phenomena interacting with each other. But we do have some uh, simple empirical relationships etcetera to determine the wave loads. So, among the factors which pose a problems for us in the evaluation of the wave forces are 
the non-linearity of the particle displacements and kinematics. What we have seen so far is the particle kinematics and displacements due to linear waves. When I say linear waves, it is just regular sinusoidal waves. But waves cannot need not be linear, very often it not, will not be linear. What do you mean by non-linear? In simple definition, the crest portion would be higher than the trough portion. The crest may be steeper and the trough may be flatter. So, in that case, you cannot really define that wave as a in form of a sine curve, sine uh, definition. So, there are so many theories uh, to describe the such kind of non-linear waves, which we will take up later. But this non-linearity of the particle displacements and kinematics is one important factor, which is contributing to errors or may be leading to complications in the evaluation of the wave forces. The next is variability of wave profiles that is what I was just telling. You may have a steep crest and a flat trough. You will not be in a position to define, you cannot define that kind of a profile by a simple sinusoidal wave which we have seen earlier. Then turbulence, this is another which is not well understood that poses some difficulties. Then the presence of the structure modifies the wave properties. The waves get scattered depending on the size of the structure, which we will be seeing later. And there may be the possibility of a dynamic effects such as vortex shedding and structure resonance. So, this again depends on the type of fixity you are having for the structure, how slender the structure is etcetera. Structure response as well as vortex shedding, I am sure that you would have studied in your basic courses in civil engineering or any other fields of engineering. But anyway, we will be looking at this later. I hope things are clear now. Okay. Now, we will proceed on the wave forces, the equations for defining the wave force. Wave force equation represent an unsteady non-uniform flow condition for which the dynamic effects are non-deterministic. There are a few steps, immediate steps to be adopted for the calculation of wave force. Or, in other words, these few steps, in one way or other, may be responsible for also leading into certain degree of uncertainties in the evaluation of wave force. For instance, you have to describe the particle motions, a wave is moving and you have the particles moving under the waves and its motion only is going to induce the loading on the structure. This movement of uh, the particles is very clearly understood as far as the linear theory is concerned. Depending on the water depth conditions, for instance, it is if uh, the water depth condition is uh, uh, deep, then you will have circular orbits, size reducing at a distance of L naught by 2 below the mean sea level, it is almost negligible. 
whereas in shallow waters you see that the particles will be moving over the entire depth of almost same magnitude. So, you will see that the force exerted will be almost same. This I have also illustrated when I have uh, when I spoke about the wave theories, I mean uh, a linear wave theory. So, if you are using a linear wave theory in a location where the waves are not following a linear theory, then a certain degree of error may would result not may would result if you adopt a linear theory for describing the particle velocities, accelerations etcetera. So, before you are before you get into solving a problem for wave forces, first you have to check whether this follows a linear theory, whether we can apply a linear theory for evaluating the particle velocities. I later I will also be covering a topic on finite amplitude wave theories, wherein you will be exposed the regions of applicability for linear theory and other uh, kinds of wave theories. So, right now we will try to adopt only the linear theory, but with a caution that you would have uncertainties or the uncertainties in the evaluation of forces may be due to inappropriate selection of the wave theory for the description of particle displacements or velocities. Or the second one is as indicated here choice of empirical coefficients there are certain coefficients please recollect what we have understood in basic fluid mechanics. I am sure all of you would have come across coefficient of drag. It is an empirical coefficient and how do you get this coefficient of drag? Coefficient of drag in basic fluid mechanics is, is obtained from a published literature wherein several, several authors would have done carried out experiments determined with the speed with which the flow takes place and then determining the force on a single pile or some pile or structure and then coming out with the drag coefficient. So, usually the drag coefficient is presented as a function of Reynolds number. So, the in a similar way, so the, the this coefficient of drag is nothing but an empirical co coefficient and we as we use only the experimentally available values. So, this may result in some kind of a variation. Later if you see there is so much of literature available on the variation of coefficient of drag as a function of Reynolds number or any other form of flow parameter, dimensionless flow parameter which we will be seeing later. So, remember that there are two kinds of uncertainties which may result. One is in the selection of the empirical coefficients of drag or inertia which I will introduce that inertia term later. And the first one is the selection of appropriate wave theory. Since we will be applying linear wave theory to begin with, let us see where the linear theory is applied. Linear wave theory can be used if h by g t square 
is less than 0 0.001 in deep and intermediate water depth conditions. Deep is d by L greater than 0 0.5 and intermediate d by L in between 0 0.5 and 0 0.05. However, in general offshore structures are designed for h by g t square greater than 0 0.001 and linear theory is expected to underestimate the force. So, this should be at the back of your mind when you are working with linear Now, let us get into various force regimes. I will be introducing certain uh, words like diffraction, drag, inertia etcetera. In a broader sense, the wave forces can, wave force regimes can be classified as in the form of uh, as a function of the relative characteristic dimension, which is diameter of the structure divided by the wavelength. If uh, d by L is greater than 1, condition of pure reflection takes place. We will look at uh, reflection etcetera later about the phenomena. If d by L greater than 0.2, diffraction increasingly important. What does that mean? That means, the diameter of the structure is quite large compared to the wavelength. That is, it is greater than 0.2. So, if you have a larger structure and the waves go and hit the structure, waves get scattered due to the presence of this large structure. And scattering of the waves because of the presence of a large structure is called as diffraction or sometimes it is referred to as scattering. The next uh, case is d by L less than 0.2, in which case the diffraction is said to be negligible. Note that we have used wavelength but then you have d by L naught greater than 0.2 L naught is the deep water wavelength. Deep water wavelength is usually greater than the wavelength decreases as you go towards the shore. From deep water, the wavelength keeps on decreasing, which we have seen earlier. So, d by L naught, if that is greater than 0.2, we say that the force is predominantly inertial. And if d by L naught is less than 0.2, we say that drag is dominant. All of you would have heard about drag force. You have a, a structure, you have the four, uh, wave, I mean flow taking place and how do you write the drag force? Drag force is, I am sure all of you would have seen this, half into C D into projected area into rho into u square. This is the usual uh, uh, drag force which we have all learned during our undergraduate course. But here we are considering a, an unsteady flow. What, what does that mean? We are considering a, a wave interacting with a structure. How do you define a wave? A wave is going to vary with respect to 
time. Remember, eta is some amplitude or I would just simply say h by 2 into sin of k x minus sigma t. And I have also explained earlier what is the what does x and t convey at a given location the variation of the profile with respect to time that is your wave profile in a particular location. And then the other thing is at a given instant of time if you have a tank at a given instant of time what is the amplitude here, what is the amplitude there, what is the amplitude there that is with respect to space both have to be are included in this. Okay. So, now you see that eta is varying with respect to time. So, we have to consider that. So, that is going to induce an acceleration because it is going to vary with respect to time it is going to include, include uh, uh, I mean insert a acceleration term which is going to be responsible for the inertial force acting on a structure. So, here if you see inertia dominant means that means it is acceleration induced force that is higher. Drag dominant means the viscous effects is more. Okay. So, that is why we say that is drag dominant. So, these are the broader classification of the wave force regions. When you look at uh, uh, waves, wave forces in the broader sense you can have either design wave approach or irregular wave approach. What is the design wave approach? You want to design a pile and it has to sustain the extreme conditions in the in the ocean. So, you have to evaluate what is called as the design wave. Civil engineers you remember we when we want to design a dam we look at the design flood. The design flood is 100 year design flood. So, here again you have to arrive at the design wave for a given particular site. I will introduce later the concept of random waves, but as of now you should have in mind that the ocean waves If you measure the water surface elevation in the ocean, the time history will be something like this. So, this is a random wave and you need to analyze this random wave and you arrive at certain statistical parameters from which you finally, you will come up with a design wave which will have a design wave height and a corresponding wave period. For which you will be evaluating the wave force, is that clear? that is what is called as design wave approach. 
the other approach is that in the design wave approach the irregular wave is represented as a statistical parameter which will be a single parameter okay but in the irregular wave approach see first there is one wave coming and hitting a smaller wave then you have a, a larger wave then a medium wave again so each time it is hitting it is hitting the structure with a particular amplitude and a particular frequency so you consider all these things or all this combination of a number of waves with different wave heights and frequencies and evaluate the wave force and then present how your force will look like you understood so that uh, that is what is called as irregular wave approach so usually irregular wave approach you will be presenting the results in what is called as a, a frequency domain which will be looking like this you will have frequency here and you will have some kind of amplitude on the y axis which is referred to as spectral density so this figure will give you how the forces vary for different frequency components in the random in the design wave approach you are going to deal only with one frequency that is the entire frequencies are represented by a single wave period you understood the, the other way of uh, presenting this will be probability approach you can have the force and you can get the probability i mean cumulative probability density function so it will be something like this which i am not going to take up now is only to introduce you to the two approaches but when we look at the short term statistics etc that time we'll have a more better uh, understanding of uh, the uh, formulations and other aspects so this is what i had already explained in the design wave approach this method for, of determining the fluid loading on structures due to wave is still the most common one it's being still used the 100 year wave is usually chosen as the design wave for the survival condition okay so when you design uh, any structure there are two aspects one is the operating wave conditions and another is the survival condition so naturally the wave height or wave climate for the survival condition will be much higher compared to the operational condition having had some amount of exposure to the basics now we will go again we still we are in fundamental only so the wave force on a pile look at the boundary condition pile resting on the bed and piercing the free surface for this condition only the formulation was proposed by morrison et al as early as 1950 for the evaluation of wave forces even today this equation is being widely adopted remember that morrison equation should be applied only when you have the viscous effects and also when you have the combination during which you have the combination of both drag and inertia component 
for certain conditions the inertia may be dominant or certain conditions wave conditions the drag may be dominant. So, let us see what is meant by Morrison equation. The most important thing is that Morrison equation is valid only for d by L less than 0.2. We also have later we will see there is another parameter which is also important that is a relative wave height, wave height divided by the diameter. If it is greater than 1, then we can say that the total force will be drag force plus inertia force and if it is less than 1, we can conveniently say that the total force is approximately equal to F i. That is under this situation and this is one condition, this is one single condition d by L less than 0.2. Under this d by L less than 0.2, you have two conditions h by d greater than 1 or less than 1. This drag force and inertia force we will be seeing immediately after this slide. So, total force acting on the structure will be orbital particle velocity dependent drag force which is referred to as F d and particle acceleration dependent inertia force. For large size members more complex theories are necessary in order to take into account the scattering radiation of the incident wave from the member. Because here in this case for d by L less than 0.2, the size of the structure is less. So, you do not have the problem of scattering. So, it is quite easy to work with, but you have uncertainties. So, this is at we have seen this condition for application of Morrison equation. Morrison equation is used when you have the drag force dominating. Whenever you have the drag force, what is drag force? Drag force is particle velocity dependent. So, now look at the wave force regimes. Now, I introduce a parameter similar to Reynolds number. We have what is called as Culligan Carpenter number. So, which is u max t by d. u max is particle maximum horizontal particle velocity over a time period. that is something like displacement. Okay. To divided by the diameter of the structure. We will try to understand more about Culligan Carpenter number later. But right now what it is u max t by u max is orbital velocity. So, displacement divided by the time. Okay. The other parameter on the x axis is what is called as scattering parameter. Scattering parameter k is small k it is 2 pi by L into A, A is radius of the structure which is d by L. 
Okay. So, this can be nothing but pi d by L as indicated in the. So, this shows the different force regimes. So, for example, if uh, you are given structure and the wave characteristics, I mean uh, if uh, K A and K C, if you are given a structure and the wave climate, what are you supposed to do? You are supposed to evaluate the parameters which we have seen right now, either these parameters as I have indicated or those parameters which are indicated there. This gives a very clear picture. For example, if your regime falls under this, then <coughs> this indicates that the total force is inertial, the viscous force being negligible. And above that, this is the zone where you have large inertia, the percentage of drag being just 1 percent. And this is the area where you have a C m and C d both have values and we have at least 10 percent of the drag force in the total force because the total force is a combination of drag force and inertia force. The top one is large drag, drag nearly 90 percent of the total force will be drag force. And this is uh, the line providing you the deep water wave curve. Now, K A as you see for all these things for the Morrison equation to be adopted, this is the region. Is that clear? So, you are not supposed to strictly adopt your Morrison, re, Morrison equation for this region, which is nothing but the diffraction region. Before understanding the Morrison equation, be clear about where you can adopt this equation, under what conditions, what are the parameters you need to evaluate before you can assign the Morrison equation for the evaluation of the wave forces. Of course, the lecture will be followed up with one or two examples, worked out examples, wherein things will be much more clear. You earlier saw that the wave force regime, one is the flow parameter comes into picture. Apart from the flow parameters, the structural dimension also is very important in deciding the regime, flow regime or the force regime. So, in order to have some kind of feeling for the size of the structures which we are talking about in ocean, in the ocean, structures in the ocean. This slide is quite useful, which gives the variety of uh, structures that could be found in the offshore or that needs to be designed, gravity and uh, tethered buoyant platforms, semi submersible structures jacket structures, jacket rigs and each of these structures have different components like for example, in this case you will have columns and caissons. Here you can have, you will have hull columns again bracings. Note that the structure diameter is given in meters. So, you see that 
the diameter can be anywhere between 0.3 to as high as about 100 meters. Now, this gives us a feeling for the size of structures which we are going to deal with in the field of ocean engineering for design of offshore structures. I hope this is clear. Now, let us get into the Morrison equation. I am taking a, a pile as shown here resting on the seabed fixed to the seabed and piercing the free surface and the diameter is d and I am taking an element of height d z at an elevation s from the seabed and a wave is propagating from left to right. What is the force total force acting on that element? The total force acting at that element which is referred to as sectional force is summation of the drag force and the inertia force acting over this element. If we can determine this force, then you know that this force is going to vary from the seabed up to the crest of the wave. So, you can integrate to get the total force moment etcetera. So, the principle involved in the concept of inertia force is that a, a water particle moving in a wave carries a momentum along with it that is clear a wave is moving. As the water particle passes around the cylinder, it accelerates and then deaccelerates because it is a wavy flow. So, that means this requires that work has to be done through the application of a force on the cylinder to increase this momentum. Okay. So, the incremental force on a small segment as we have seen earlier that is the d z needed to accomplish this that is the above aspect is now will be proportional to the water particle acceleration at the center of the cylinder. Is that clear? So, I can simply say that the force acting on that particular element d z is equal to C m that is the empirical coefficient of inertia, where a certain degree of uncertainty prevails as stated earlier into mass density pi d square by 4 and you have the acceleration coming into picture. So, this is your inertia force and inertia force coefficient would also vary other terms are given here. Now, if you look at the drag force, the principal cause of the drag force component is due to the presence of a wake region on the down drift or down stream, downstream of the cylinder. The cylinder is here, the wave is moving in this direction. So, you will have a, a wake on the downstream side. What is a wake? A wake is nothing but a region of low pressure on the downstream side compared to the pressure on the upstream side. So, there is a kind of a pressure difference created by the wake between the upstream and the downstream of the cylinder at any given point of time. The pressure difference causes a force that will be 
that will be exerted on the cylinder and it will be in the direction of flow taking place. So, you have half into C D into rho into D into absolute of u into absolute of uh, sorry absolute of u. So, this is one important uh, uh, thing which you need to remember you look at the absolute value as uh, I have said earlier the drag force is half into C D into rho into projected area into u square am I right? This is the usual way of evaluating the drag force. Now, you have a an absolute here absolute value this absolute value is to take care of the direction it is nothing but to take care of the direction because you see that when the wave is moving like this the velocity is going to change because velocity is some into sin of k x minus sigma t that is if you call this as equal to eta or the phase then you see that the direction is going to change. Depending on this for one full cycle you will have plus and negative. If you do not have the have the uh, 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 absolute sign then what will happen you are not really representing the direction of the flow it will take positive all the way through and the negative component will not come at all. So, in order to take care of the direction of the flow we have an absolute value and again you see that there is a coefficient of drag. So, combining the inertia and the drag component we have the force on that elemental height of d z given as d f etcetera that is equation 3. Now, if the cylinder extends from the ocean floor to the still water line then the total force on the cylinder is given by an integral minus d by minus d remember that for us z is 0 at this point. So, z will be minus d at this point. So, from the seabed up to the still water line in fact, strictly speaking you have to carry out this integration up to eta because you can have you will have the waves coming up to this level. So, you need to include that eta also ok. For simplicity I have just stopped at 0. So, herein you have to substitute the expressions for u and u dot which we have seen earlier. So, this should be so this is a sin theta and then cos theta. So, these two components will be out of phase. So, substitute in this equation carrying out all the integration you will come across this expression and we will continue this later.